Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob here, Light of the World Ministries. You know the deal. This is going to be Judah Part 20, um, Part B, I guess, because the uh, this is the longest chapter in this book. Well, plus I read a lot of other things that made it over an hour long. So. Yeah, I've still got, uh, we're on page 238 of Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright. And uh, it goes to page 245. So, let's uh, do the part B here. It has been estimated that the number of the Israelites which came out of Egypt in the Exodus were two and a half million. All who will take time to think will soon comprehend how impossible it would be even for a fertile country, much less a desert, to supply such a multitude as well as their cattle, of which not a hoof was left behind, with food and water unless special arrangements were made for an extra supply. Bob's note here. I don't know about two and a half million, but I know that there was hundreds of thousands. I mean, <laughs> it was a lot of people, a lot. But in this case, as a matter of course, that was not done because it became necessary for God to furnish the supply of food and water for that vast concourse of people and also for their herds and flocks. It is a well-known fact that the Lord continually provided food for Israel during those 40 years of wandering in the desert wilderness. Bob's note here. You know, God took Israel out of Egypt because he wanted to take Egypt out of Israel. He wanted to show them he was going to supply them with food. He was going to supply them with water. In 40 years, their shoes never wore out. Did they have health problems? I mean, you know, there's no doctor. There's no dentist. I mean, surely they must have been totally amazed at the provisions of the Lord. However, do the people appreciate such things? No, generally not. All right, so. The first mention of no water for the people to drink was while the Israelites were encamped at Rephidim, Without previously selecting one special rock, the Lord said unto Moses, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it. The phrase, there in Horeb, points out the place where the rock was at the time. And if the Lord, when he spoke of the rock, had used the demonstrative form and said that rock then we should know that he was designating designating which one or a certain one not yet selected but the fact that he said the rock is proof to us that he is uh, he was speaking of a rock with which they were already familiar may it not have been the Bethel pillar rock the shepherd, the stone of Israel, which had been committed to the keeping of the house of Joseph. This possibility is more clearly manifest in the account of the other circumstances when there was no water which occurred at Kadesh, a city in the border of Edom, the country which belonged to the descendants of Esau. Bob's note here. Esau was Jacob's brother. 
Um, I they I guess they were twins. I don't know if they were identical twins or not. Probably not. No, they were not identical twins. Absolutely not, because Esau was hairy and Jacob was smooth. So, at this place, the people of Israel were very bitter against Moses and Aaron and said unto them, Why have ye brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there? You know, God hates murmuring. And wherefore have ye made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us into this evil place? It is no place of seed, or of figs, or of vines, or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. Bob's note here. When somebody tells you the glory of the Lord is the she kinda, the Shekinah, run, run away from these people. Because the Shekinah is not the Holy Spirit. That comes from the enemy. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take ye the rod, and gather the assembly together, and speak ye unto the rock, before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock. So thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we, must we, Fetch water out of this rock. And, uh, you know, that was kind of a, that was a no-no. Not kind of. It was a no-no. The Lord is the rock. The Lord is the one supplying the water. There's no we. So, yeah. And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod he smote the rock twice. He was told to strike the rock, but he did it twice. And the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. That is in the book of Numbers, chapter 20, verses 5 through 11. We have quoted this account in full from the beginning of the complaint by the people until the water was given, that our readers may see that although the phrase, the rock, is used four times, there is not the slightest indication that there was any selection or indication of preference for any certain rock in the vicinity of Kaddish, or that one was not already chosen and in their midst. It was to show also that at the very first mention of water from the people from this rock, all that was necessary as a preparatory measure was for the Lord to say to Moses, Speak to the rock. And also that when the people were commanded to gather before the rock, they understood so well which rock it was that in all that vast company of two and a half million, no explanations were necessary. Hence, it must have been among them before this and well known. Let us also bear in mind that this name, The Rock, and no, not the movie star, was used in the same relation as Rephidim, and yet the children of Israel had removed, journeyed, and pitched their tents 21 times after leaving Rephidim, and here at Kadesh there is with them that which is still famili familiarly known as The Rock. Uh, you can take a look at Numbers chapter 33. We know that stones are rocks and that rocks are stones, so that a rock or stone is only one rock or a stone, and the appellation, the rock, and the stone must refer to some special or particular stone or rock, 
as we have seen, Israel must have been in possession of just such a special rock, i.e. the Bethel stone, and that Jacob set it up and called it a pillar. Later in the days of Athaliah, after she tried to destroy all the males of the royal seed, but did not succeed for the reason that an infant son of Ahaziah, whom Athaliah succeeded to the throne, was stolen from those whom she had ordered slain and hidden. The stealing and hiding of this infant was so cleverly done that it was not missed by the court slayer. This infant, whose name was Joash, was kept hidden from the wicked queen for six years. During this time, she reigned, not knowing that there was a male heir to the throne who could dethrone her. But in the seventh year, the secret was revealed to the rulers over hundreds and to the captains of the guards and quiet arrangements made to proclaim the seven-year-old prince as their king. The plans were successful and Athaliah knew nothing of it until she heard the people in the temple shouting, God save the king. God save the king. That's in the Bible, people. The people in Israel were saying, God save the king. Um, guess what they say in England, or have said in England? Yeah, God save the king. Yeah. All right. Um, Thus it is recorded that when Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people into the temple of the Lord, and when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar as the manner was. That's in 2 Kings 11, 13 and 14. Concerning this pillar, Dr. Adam Clark's translation reads, stood on a pillar, which he explains is the place or throne on which they were accustomed to put their kings when they proclaimed them. But in the revised version, it is rendered standing by the pillar, as was their custom. The article denoting this particular pillar by or upon which it was the custom of Israel to crown their kings. Again, when the good king Josiah made a covenant before the Lord in the presence of all the people that he would destroy idolatry out of the land, it is written, and the king stood by a, or the, pillar and made a covenant before the Lord. 2 Kings 23, verse 3. Now remember, Josiah was a good king, okay? There is in the Second Chronicles a recapulation of the circumstances concerning Josiah, which gives the following. And the king stood in his place, his place, we are told, was by the pillar, which might properly be translated pillar stone, upon which all the kings of Israel were crowned, made covenants, took oaths, or made vows, as did Jacob when he first set it up for a pillar and made it God's house. This stone is not only called the pillar, the rock, Bethel, and the stone of Israel, but wonderful to, to tell it is also called the shepherd. Bob's note here. Remember I read that, uh, and that rock was Christ in Corinthians in part A? Yeah. And that rock was Christ. And Christ called himself the shepherd, the good shepherd, right? And since it really is the stone of Israel, we should expect it to be with them to whom it belonged, but since it is also the shepherd of Israel, its very name and character for with God names are always characteristic. Demand that it should be with Israel in all their wanderings. Hence, this shepherd, though it is only a stone, as any other shepherd would do, must go with his flock. We have said that this stone of Israel was a type or symbol for proof, let us go back to the place called Bethel. 
There we shall find that Jacob, after setting up the rock for a pillar, also anointed it with oil, which in sacred symbols is typical of the Holy Ghost. And according to sacred history, this Bethel stone is the only single individual stone that has ever been anointed. Hence, among stones, it is preeminently the anointed one. When Christ, the great prototype, came and was anointed with the Holy Ghost, he was preeminently among men the anointed one. Also concerning the rock, Bob's note here, I did a uh, Bible study on the rock, if anybody's interested. Also concerning the rock, which accom accompanied Israel, the Lord could say to Israel's leader, speak to the rock. But on the other hand, Israel also could say concerning their divine presence that went with them, let us sing unto the rock of our salvation. Bob's note here. When you're in the desert and there's no food, no water, and the rock is supplying you with water, and you're getting manna from heaven, isn't that salvation for your earthly body? I would say so. Let's keep reading. Again, this stone is called the Shepherd of Israel, but there is also a divine one unto whom Israel prayed, saying, Give ear, O Shepherd of Israel. Later, when the same shepherd was manifest in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16, he said, I am the good shepherd, and his apostles spoke of him as the great shepherd and the chief shepherd. Hence the oft-repeated metaphor of sheep and flock in both the Old and New Testaments. Further, Israel had a pillar rock which went with them as their shepherd in all their journeyings in the wilderness. But it is also written that the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them in the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. And you can find that in the book of Exodus, people. Still further, the scriptures might be fulfilled. Israel's divine shepherd rock was smitten, for it is written, Smite the shepherd. So too, Israel's shepherd rock was smitten. The Lord knew that he must be smitten for the sins of the people, and that the type and prototype might agree. He gave command, smite the rock. Oh, the pain of it all, especially to him, but he shall yet see the desire of his heart, i.e. his emotional nature, his soul, and be satisfied. It is also said of Israel that they did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. And that's in the book of Corinthians. I read that in part A. It is also true that they did all drink from the same refreshing stream which flowed from that literal rock which also went with them for it was their shepherd rock no doubt israel was supplied with water from this rock in the wilderness as well as at rephidim and kadesh for the country between these two points uh, between these two places is much more desert than these cities at kadesh Moses sent messengers to the king of Edom, asking permission for the Lord's host to pass through his country, and told them to say, Thus saith thy brother Israel, Let us pass, I pray thee, through thy country. We will not pass through the fields or through the vineyards, neither will we drink of the water of the wells. We will go by the king's highway. We will not turn to the right hand nor to the left until we have passed thy borders and if i and my cattle drink of thy water then i will pay thee for it i will only without doing anything else go through on my feet just imagine a company of two and one half million traveling on foot through a country that is several hundred miles in length giving assurance to its ruler that they would keep to the highway and not turn to the right or to the left 
for any reason, nor drink water out of the wells, i.e. pits, fountains, springs, or wells, literally their water supply of that country. Israel could afford to make this proposition for both their shepherd rocks were with them, i.e. the literal and the spiritual rock, and they knew that he who had hitherto furnished them with food and water would still continue to supply them until the end of the journey. Otherwise, Moses would never have made such a promise. True, there was a conditional promise made in which there was a promise to pay for any of the water of Edom which might be used. But this, as you see, was made chiefly, if not altogether on account of the cattle, which they might not be able to control and keep to the dusty highways while passing by the cool and tempting pools and springs of water. This might prove to be a difficult task for the cattle drivers, especially in the heat of the day, hence this provi provision. They were not supposed to get water from the rock until they had completed their day's journey and pitched their tents. Thus we have seen that among the Israelites there were two rocks, two houses, two kingdoms, two nations, or a scepter and a birthright company. Of these two great divisions, Judah and Joseph are the representatives. By divine appointment, one of these rocks was given to the birthright family and the other to the scepter family. The Bethel pillar shepherd stone of Israel was given to Joseph, but to Judah was given the spiritual rock, which was Christ. For it is written that our Lord sprang out of Judah. Uh, Bob's note here. There are people that will tell you that uh, Jesus came from Joseph. Uh, where's that in the Bible? It's not. Nope, the Bible says our Lord sprang out of Judah. Both of these rocks, each in a different way, have been rejected, but each of them shall yet become the head of the corner. And people, this is, that is the end of uh, part B of this uh, chapter. And uh, let's, let's take a look at something.